E mihi ana ki te rangi, e mihi ana ki te whenua, e mihi ana ki ngā tūpuna i te pō, e mihi ana ki ngā uri i te āwātea, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora e te whānau, kua haere mai nei, i tēnei rā, ki te kōrero, ki te āko, ki te whakarongo. E mihi nui ana ki ngā manuhiri i kō nei. Kia tātou, kia pai te hui, kia pai te rā, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm very disappointed that you're not watching television at 9.30 every Monday night religiously. I'm a journalist for TVNZ. I host a program called Q&A and I work for NZME, host a program on News Talk ZB. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today discussing an important but somewhat divisive subject. And how could well-being possibly be divisive? Well, I, I look at the Swiss balls in the corner and I look at the bean bags. And I know that there are many within our community who still think well-being is a wishy-washy buzzword, a concept that doesn't necessarily translate to any measurable forms of prosperity. That's what we want to unpack with our panel this morning. So in no particular order, I will introduce them. Angie Mentis is the VNZ CEO. Uh, Catherine Jackson is the author of Resilience at Work and a Business Innovator. Christine Brotherton is the HR Director at Minton, uh, Minter Ellison Rudd Watts. Nick Stan Hope is the CEO of AIA. Jazz Thornton is the founder of Voices at Hope. She's making her way to the UN next week to launch an exciting new uh, program with Lady Gaga, as you do. <laughs> Craig Mulholland is the Managing Director of Wealth and Private Banking at ANZ. So please put your hands together and welcome our panel this morning. <laughs> Like I say, I, and perhaps it's the journalist in me, I'm, I'm naturally a sceptical individual. So when I saw the government uh, was launching what it called the well-being budget and said that all of a sudden, as a government, they cared about the climate and they cared about the mental health of New Zealand citizens, I thought, well, hang on, isn't that something that every government has always cared about or at least purported to care about? So I thought perhaps for us, panel, it would be a good idea to start with that, that, jet, that word and that concept generally, well-being. Um, Angie, I know just today you have, uh, this morning, released very, very timely, and we appreciate that, your, your latest well-being index. So perhaps we could start with you. How do you go about defining a concept like well-being? Kia ora, Jack, and thank you for having us. So a few things in terms of well-being for us, it's very much around you know, the societal, the society, environmental. I'm just going to pause you there. We'll just see, have we got a, got a microphone issue with Angie? Angie, okay, well, we'll hold you there and we'll come back to you okay. in just a moment. Craig, we can start with you then. Um, I, I, ANZ has also done plenty of research into, into well-being. So tell us what your data and responses tell you about well-being. How do you go about defining it? In, in 2018, we did a survey around financial well-being and historically, it had been looking at sort of financial literacy and the importance of financial literacy and knowledge for people, and would that lead to well-being? We then started looking at the behavioural side of it, and what we found um, was it was, quite, it was quite profound that what led to people's you know, feeling good about themselves and their financial well-being, it really came down to you know, having an active savings program and not having to borrow um, to meet everyday needs. And so what that then led to was you could have people who are on high incomes or have investments but not feel a sense of financial well-being because they were either borrowing and they didn't have an active savings program. And the flip side is you could have people on low incomes which in turn um, did have a sense of financial well-being because they, they were saving and they were living within their means and, and the vice versa was true. So you know, well-being really came down to the state of mind of the person and how they're feeling about themselves, how they're feeling about their outlook on life and what they're wanting to achieve. Is it happiness? Is, it, is that what it is? It's about having control of your destiny. It's about knowing um, where you're going and knowing you can achieve that and not having the everyday stress of how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to do this? I've now got this unintended uh, expense or, and I've had to borrow money for it. How am I going to pay that back and then keep living? So, just you know, narrowly um, within the context of financial well-being, it really came down to you know, can we um, save and can we pay our bills without having to go into expense? And one of the key stats we came that you know, if someone could even save $1,000, know, their financial well-being was far greater than 
you know, someone who had less than a thousand dollars, and you know, and you know, people without savings, obviously, um, you know, they had the stress of you know, financial issues. Angie, we can come back to you. What does your latest data tell so, you? So we've um, produced our second uh, BNZ uh, wellbeing uh, survey, and we're doing an index. And the, um, so the well-being is measured in life worth, life satisfaction, level of happiness, level of anxiety. And there were four key themes that um, came out of, of this one. Firstly, that um, New Zealanders' well-being is, is highly correlated with their age and their income, which makes sense. Uh, over 50s have a higher sense of well-being, and over a household income of 100,000 have a higher sense of well-being. Under $35,000 uh, of household income, um, uh, not as... as well on the well-being. Interestingly, even over the 100,000, about 25% of those surveyed were still feeling um, uh, not, not as high well-being. The second thematic was that it, there is widespread financial hardship and, um, and financial stress in, in New Zealand. Sadly, very much uh, correlated with 18 to 29-year-old um, age group and women and those on, on single incomes. Um, and the third one was very much around um, uh, how uh, your saving and your wealth uh, is contributing to well-being. What we found um, quite uh, surprisingly was that 60% of those surveyed did not feel that they would have enough for, um, uh, for retirement. And one of the biggest uh, sources of anxiety was uh, New Zealanders not having enough uh, for an emergency, enough money for an emergency. And then the fourth thematic that came out was around lifting productivity and lifting financial capability was a key ingredient mm -hmm. to lifting the well-being of New Zealanders. Nick, do any of those come as a surprise to you? No, not at all. Um, I mean, it, this is a complex area, there's no question about that. And it sort of spans multi-dimensional aspects, financial sector, uh, well-being. Um, but for us, I, I think it's about ownership, and ownership at probably three levels. First level, I think government. So I think about my own experience. I used to ride to work um, in Auckland City, um, and, and that's, for me, not possible now. I live in Takapuna, work, work in Takapuna, and as such, I'd have to do a pretty long ride to get over to work and back in every day. I can get a ferry over there. So I think you know, Grant Robinson and, and the work he's doing at a, at a government level, I think the, um, the Fitter City report also highlighted some difficulty we have as people in, in being fit and being healthy. Um, at a corporate level, I think there's certainly a role uh, and we are looking to play that with our Vitality program. One of the things that, that came out of um, our program, we got our staff through MOLMAP. And, and this is about sort of personal accountability as well, but of those people that went through it, which is a significant number, 20% had some sort of cancerous lesion. So BCG, SCG, or melanoma. Um, and when you think about that and think of the population, and I challenge people in this room, how many people in this room have had a mole map or a doctor look at their skin in the last 12 months? Okay. <laughs> There's a lot that haven't, and we live in a country that, uh, that has you know, major issues in this area. So that's one example, I think, uh, on a corporate level. On a personal level, um, you know, for me, I think it's doing small things. So for me, I've reflected, um, and it just so happened that Vitality, our program, got me focused on some things I can do differently. Sleep a little longer, uh, drink a little less. Very easy to go home at night after a stressful day and have one or two beers, do the maths on that over a year. That's quite big. Um, and, and don't play catch-up in the weekend, by the way. That doesn't work. Uh, so... So doing a few things that can make a difference in your life personally, uh, for me, I think for individuals, we need to understand our own position with health and you know, get a medical checkup, go see a doctor, understand where you are now and, and have a goal and set some ambition to where you want to be. We're fortunate on, on the panel today to have um, members from, from a range of backgrounds and experiences and I think it might be valuable over the next half an hour or so to break things down into two distinct areas. So we look at things from an organisational or business side but also look at things from, dare I say, a consumer side, from a real life side. Um, and Jazz, I wondered if you could speak to us. Many people here will remember your address from last year but talk to us a little bit about your experience and your take on wellbeing. 
Um, my take on well-being, um, I actually found the the stats that you were talking about quite interesting because in the um, in the suicide statistics that we have, uh, there are double the amount of people that took their life that were employed than unemployed. Um, and so uh, the, the, obviously you've got stresses and there's a whole lot of different reasons as to why, but also one in four Kiwis will struggle with a mental health issue. So this is not just something... Um, that is for a specific group of people, that's a quarter of this room. Um, and so I think that well-being and, and talking about that um, is so important. And for me personally, those of you who were here last year, um, you would have heard bits and pieces of my story, um, but I, I had quite a, a rough upbringing. Um, the first time I tried to take my life, I was 12 years old, and um, that kind of threw me into this uh, spiral for, for many of my teenage years. I was in and out of psych wards. I was in a coma um, after trying to take my life. Literally everything looked impossible. Um, and at that point, no one was talking about mental health. No one was talking about well-being. And there's nothing quite like that to a teenage girl to make her feel like she is completely alone. Um, and so for me now to be able to look, um, as even around this room and at, at banks and at, at companies that are willing to actually stand up and do something about it um, for both people in their own company, but also New Zealand, uh, is really significant because I was once that girl. Uh, I was once the girl that was literally batting, battling for her life. Um, but now I get to sit here as proof um, that, that investing time and investing money and investing effort into this area um, can have fantastic outcomes. It's interesting though, isn't it? I mean, the, the government is pouring money into mental health, mm. $1.9 billion committed to mental health services. Um, there will be people who, who look at that sort of expenditure and who look at the shift around the conversation in mental health in New Zealand over the last few years. You know, the likes of uh, Sir John Kerwin and, and Mike King who have front-footed these very public campaigns. Mm. There, will people, there will be people who say there is no longer the stigma around mental health that once existed, even just five or ten years ago. We are pouring money into these services. But isn't it stuff at the other end? Dare I say the ambulance before the cliff that matters. It's, it's stuff around housing and education mm -hmm. and economic disparity that really matters. And, and while it's great that we're pouring money into those emergency level services, actually it's stuff much, much earlier that we need to engage They are with. doing that though. So there's quite a bit of a, a big part of the budget that has been put into early intervention, um, which is like at the moment, if you go to your GP and you say that you're struggling, unless you are very wealthy or you're about to die, there is literally nothing available for you. Mm. Um, and so a lot of the budget has been looking into that. And I, I, I did quite a lot of media when it came out and I was basically saying that you could put $1.9 billion into mental health in the same structure, um, and that will do jackal. But it, it literally is about um, restructuring the way that we actually do this and looking at all the early intervention. And that's why governments for so long and people for so long have like talked about mental health but not done anything because it is a beast to try and deal with. And it is about all that... that um, earlier stuff like housing and financing and, and stresses and also domestic violence um, and child abuse and poverty, all of our rates in these are so high. But the, the thing is, our, our government are actually, like, they're putting it into action. They're mm. doing something which is more than what a lot of other governments can say. Christine, I'll, I'll go to you here. What has been your experience from an <laughs> HR and managerial level a, as to, as to you know, dealing with your own employees and staff. Yeah, is I guess, is um, well-being something they're really... Yeah, yeah, I think... Thank you. And I guess I'm, I'm here in a capacity of um, also talking about the four-day working week, so um, I'm an advocate for that. <laughs> um, and... and I guess where, where I come from is that um, it even goes back to a couple of the sort of early questions about, you know, why is it now that we're having this, you know, really intense conversation about wellbeing? And I think it's um, really it's because it's time, um, because there are a lot of, I, I guess, you know, threats. We talk about mental health, we talk about suicide rates, we talk about lack of time, we talk about lack of connections with family, um, and actually, but we also talk about our lack of productivity in New Zealand as well. And so from, from my perspective, being part of, I guess, a, quite an innovative way of looking at this is... You know, four-day week came out of a, a very simple idea of going, actually, if we gave more people, our employees, more time in their day, um, so outside of work, um, so that they could actually do things that meant that they could focus differently at work. And so um, the link between, or the connection between um, being more empowered and engaged and connected with family members, time to do things, time to be able to have a break, build resilience, be strong, sleep <laughs> as well, um, you know, does that mean that actually our product 
productivity could increase. And um, and it's early days, I guess, for Perpetual Guardian and Guardian Trust. Um, you should talk to some Guardian Trust people later on um, about their experiences of this. But you know, early signs are that you know people can feel better by getting that time in uh, in their day and to be able to actually think differently about how they work. So that comes to that mm. you know ambulance, you know, not being at the bottom of the, you know, it's actually thinking, can we actually work differently? You know, is that sort of something that we can actually try ideas to try and have different outcomes for everyone. See, see that's an interesting corporate level solution, mm. isn't it? And I was speaking with um, Craig Hudson from Zero the other day and he told me about this company in Tokoroa, I believe it was, essentially an engineering company. Basically, it was a staff of about 35 people welding most of the day and they've moved to a four day working week. So they end on a Thursday. That's it, they don't have a staggered shift over the weekend or anything like that. Productivity hasn't taken a hit. In, mm. any, in any way, shape, or form. So I wonder, if it's really that good, <laughs> it's been very well publicised. Yeah. This is something I know a lot of organisations have considered. If it's really as effective as people say it is, why don't more organisations take it up? Oh, I think it can be. Um, I think it can be quite confronting for, I guess, uh, people from a leadership perspective about, gosh, it's quite, quite different. Um, and when we think about um, our normal ways of um, of work, you know, we've got this construct which is from what the 19th century about hours of work. Um, our legislation will drive us toward that. Um, does anyone have to do anything about the Holidays Act? Um, anything? In the, anyone in the room around um, paying people? Uh, you know, all those sorts of things, we've got sort of legislation which isn't really about the future of work. Um, and the way that we feel better about the way that we can be productive and feel that we're achieving the goals and, and being with our families and doing all the things that we want to do to feel good about ourselves and actually have a sustainable future, we actually essentially don't have a legislative framework that I think really helps with that. Mm. Um, I could speak all day on this, so. Um, but I, I just think it's, um, you know, it's innovative thought. We've got to try things. We're, 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 we're coming to the, the crossroads, I guess, of kind of going, things aren't really working now, people are feeling under pressure, uh, productivity is not high, so actually, you know, think about different ways, try different things to keeping in mind, are people okay? You know, um, good customer outcomes, um, and, and yeah, making sure that people are, are, are feeling well. Catherine, what can individuals do to improve their well-being, especially around the workplace? Yeah, so I think a really, really quick and simple Emergency microphone. <laughs> um, so, so I think, um, oh dear, I think a really quick and simple thing that um, employers can do right now is actually really lean into um, the mental health foundation work. Um, you heard earlier on about um, Eddie discussing, discussing um, his experience there, and I think you know to add to what he was sharing, I think Eddie's real um, is a, another um, wonderful analogy to take away. You know what he what he shared there. Um, I think the Mental Health Foundation um, Mental Wellbeing Week is coming up. Uh, there is going to be an awful lot of activity, I think, around the country to encourage our employees to what what we're calling explore your way to wellbeing. It doesn't have to be a really big deal. Um, this is something that we can just try. So there are lots of different ideas and resources on the Mental he um, Health Foundation website. Um, I think what we're identifying is that well-being is such a personal issue. You know, we all see well-being through a very, very different lens. Um, and I think that that lens for some of us isn't, isn't seen as important. I became an accidental uh, well-being and resilience specialist um, for, for two big reasons. Um, first of all, I lived in Christchurch through um, all of the earthquakes. Um, and it was part of my responsibility to learn from organizations like the Mental Health Foundation that descended onto Christchurch. They used us as a live case study. Um, I worked within the construction industry to make a really big um, commitment to learning from that research and looking for ways to actually deliberately design well-being and resilience into workplaces, um, but to also help employees to learn how to deliberately build well-being and resilience into themselves um, because I think that's the important thing to remember as Jazz was saying you know what we want to do is recognize that mental health is not a static point in time it's not an aspiration that we reach to and then stay at there are things that happen throughout our lives that will cause us stress and pressure and so I think the really big opportunity for this industry is to look at how do we better equip the people in the room 
um, the people in our organization to be able to cope with all of that stress and pressure that's going to come our way at every point in our life. So, um, so that's, I think, is, is a, a really simple thing that people can do. Let me ask this of everyone on the panel. Who here has taken a digital detox before? Right. About half of us, maybe. Okay, okay. I'm just, I mean, the, the nature of work has changed so much in just the last 15 years, right? The fact that we are always connected. And I, and I really wonder about the impact of that, especially at an organisational level, of always being connected, of looking at your phone at 9.30 at night when you're supposed to be going to sleep early because that's good for your well-being. Do any of you have particular thoughts on the importance of disconnecting about Catherine yeah go bouncing. Um, so so yes I mean if we look at if we look at the science around this I'm terrified that our generation is going to look back in 20 years and see smartphones as the smoking of our generation um, you know we're, it's very very early days in the research but what we're starting to see is a real um, if we look at the neuroscience around this, there's a really interesting similarity of where in our brain lights up um, when we're actually actively um, you know, searching the web and look at, looking for all those likes, feeling good because somebody has actually uh, you know, liked the post that we've made, checking that people are you know, connected with us. Um, and so I just think it's really interesting. I, I, um, I've worked with clients who quite literally cannot switch their phones off and that bothers me and it bothers me for a number of reasons. First of all, for their personal health and well-being, but also imagine the impact of working with somebody like that when actually you're not that way inclined. Um, and there are places over in Europe where it's actually um, built into employer contracts. You know, when can you and can't you communicate with your employees um, outside of, of office yeah, we're hours? we're not France yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wonder though from, from I was speaking to a, a friend who is a CEO of a company and spends huge hours working every week, 70 hours a week, maybe, maybe more, and was on holiday recently and set up a system whereby he took a dumb phone, so he took a phone that couldn't receive emails or anything like that, and he had a system whereby someone at his work who was monitoring his email could text him on this dumb phone if anything catastrophic were to happen in his absence. And it was a way of alleviating that anxiety that he had from being disconnected with his digital device. And I wonder, Angie, is there something that perhaps business leaders and managers should be doing to model good behaviour around digital connectivity? I was just going to say, so having uh, been here for 20 months, I actually, um, New Zealand has something very special. So in my previous, so I'm running an entire bank, 5,000 people. I was running a pretty big business in Australia, but it was always on, 24 hours a day, mm. seven days a week, it felt like. We don't have that in New Zealand. Um, I recently went on leave in, in July. So firstly, I think you have to have good people around you that you can trust and delegate to. I got one call in three weeks, which is probably the first time in my, I've been executive leadership for probably about 20 years first time. So I, I do think we've got something very special here where it is not the always on culture. Um, so I think we need to protect that. And I do agree with you, we have to role model it. I think the boards have to role model it, the executive teams have to role model it. We've done a lot of work as well at the BNZ, just increasing the awareness right across our population, mm. but especially with our leaders around mental health, physical health, um, uh, just to make sure that everyone understands the signs, that they feel um, comfortable to speak up, that we're all looking after each other. So I think the awareness piece is hugely important and also on, on the social media piece as well. So um, we, we put research up on the sites, we've done a survey so that uh, when, when you get your survey results, it gives you tips on the things that you can do more uh, about and, and then just having those conversations in your leadership teams so that people feel comfortable to, to just get support from each other as well. But I do think as executives, we need to role model. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very good here. I was very bad role model in Australia around the emails on weekends, the emails late. Even if I save them and uh, in draft and they go Monday uh, at a, at a civilised time. So I just think it's important on all of us to role model. Nick, be honest. <laughs> if, oh. you, if you send an email, if you send an email to one of your senior leaders at, yeah. at 9.30 at night, do you expect a reply? No, no, and, and it's something you learn in terms mm. of being a CEO. You, you realise that, uh, 
You know, you see yourself as yourself, but others um, have this um, belief that they need to get back to you quickly and do that. So I do talk to my executive team and, and say that. I think digital for me is, is sort of a, a good and a bad thing. I think on the good front, um, it's given me huge flexibility with my job. So I do choose at times to work on a Friday up at Matakana, where I've got a place up there, and I just love it up there. So that gives me a chance to work and be out, out of the work environment equally. You know, I leave relatively early uh, in the day and go home and spend time with my girls. Uh, and, and, that, and then I do some work after that. I choose to do that rather than sort of come home traditionally at six o'clock. So that, that's the good side of it. Um, you know, like Angie, um, when I go to Fiji or some other place, I just say to my ear, who's awesome, Amy, um, like for her, um, you know, send me a text. Cause she, and she knows, she'll look at the emails and go, whoa, you know, Nick wants to know about this. And that's just the quality of the relation you have with your EA. So there's some good stuff, some bad stuff. The thing that I really struggle with, to be honest, is my kids. They're terrible, and, and so we, you know, the fight with teenage daughters to try and get social media devices off them. Uh, we have a rule, all the devices have to come up at nine o'clock, it sounds late, but 19 and 18 year old girls. Um, and they go in our room because they can't have the strength to be able to, to walk away from them. It's like, a, it's like a sickness, right? So that's my role right now. How they do when they leave home, I don't know, but that's my bigger concern. Yeah, so that's an interesting point you raised because there is, there is certainly some generational differences on this front. My dad's an accountant and he still swears at his phone every single day. He hates the thing, right? He'll do anything he can to get away from it. Whereas I think of my younger siblings who are in their mid-twenties just heading out into corporate um, careers and they have a completely different relationship as you would expect with their phones. So Jazz, do you see that as being something young people have to reckon with? And how can we support them in, in developing healthy habits around digital devices? Yeah, it's, um, I, I'm probably one of the worst for this, not gonna lie. <laughs> um, I, what I have discovered, um, I, I do a lot of talks in, in high schools and I get to spend a lot of time with young people and literally on their phones all the time. They say that social media has the addiction level of heroin. Um, and so you'll find like on, on iPhones now, you can see your screen time and you can see how much time you've spent on each app. Uh, and for a young person to actually look at that, it's terrifying <laughs> uh, because it, it's so high. And at the moment, you know, it's now kind of the way that we do a lot of our work. It's the way that we socialize with people. It's um, a lot of our relationships have been built upon social media and I think for um, young people that's where so much of our anxiety has come from is that there's this curated life that these people are living that you only see the highlight reel and you don't see the behind the scenes and so young people are like sitting there scrolling through Instagram seeing these feeds and going well my life will never look like that I don't look like that I don't eat like that I don't you know all of their life just doesn't look the same and so they begin to yeah, to really kind of judge judge their, the behind the scenes of their life to, to all of these curated feeds. Um, and it just, it raises anxiety. There's all these stupid apps that you can um, write things anonymously on and, and teenagers bullying so easily, but it's also really hard to tear a teenager away from their phone. So well mm. done uh, at taking them off at nine o'clock. I wish that I had that. If you're a parent in this room, as much as a fight it would be, as a 24 year old now, I wish that that happened to me when I was a teenager because it would have made it a heck of a lot easier for me to turn my phone off now mm. um, than, than it is like now I'm a little bit like Ugh! but yeah. I went to a presentation a few weeks ago from a, a US professor called Jonathan Haidt and uh, he's been looking at numbers in the US and he, he says that the generation born from 1995 on is the generation that has has never not had a digital device in their hands. And he looked at some numbers out of the US he says uh, it's the first generation that is having less sex uh, taking fewer drugs, uh, the first generation that is taking a longer time to get their driver's license. Now, some of those things will sound great. We think, oh, good, young people are taking, are taking fewer drugs and having less sex, but he says it's because they're less connected. Yeah. It's actually the great paradox of the digital age, isn't it? You know, we, we, we look at devices as a way of connecting one another, but it's simply that young people don't want to get their driver's license because they don't need it. They'll text their friends. <laughs> or post online as opposed to g going out and rooting them instead. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on, moving on. I've got a team uh, yeah. that yeah. sort of thing. Sorry, yeah. Give me the phone, give me the phone. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk, a, oh, you, you want to say something, Catherine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bring it back up a level. Yeah. Can we come back from that? I'm not quite sure how to follow that, but I think... Um, <laughs> 
So I think, but, but sort of what this means, so, when, so I look at this from a, yeah, but so what lens? Um, and so from a business perspective, I think what this means is so what? What do we do with these people when they come and work for us? And that's already happening. I've had to work with organizations that have quite literally run workshops on how to make friends, um, how to connect. I've worked with organizations that get me in to help people actually talk to other people. You know, it's their job. They're in, a, they're in a call center environment, for example, where they have to phone people. And the levels of stress and pressure that these people experience because of what they're being asked to do in their job is unprecedented. And people of my generation, I don't get it. Um, but actually, that's the reality for so many people in our workforce. I think just, sorry, just to add a little bit about, um, I guess if we think about, um, you know, digital impact, um, is also, I don't, I don't think necessarily um, we're, you know, particularly up to speed about thinking innovatively about job design as well. So from a corporate space, um, you know, we've got, um, again, I sort of say, you know, threats, or whether you say it as opportunities about, you know, how we work, um, who we work with, how we, um, at what time we wish, uh, wish to work or want to work. Um, and I just think that there's a lag in regards to, you know, how we look at that job design. Um, so, and, and thinking more about sort of team, you know, key person risk, you know, take away a team, you know, key person risk perspective, um, you know, that sort of side of things, I think that's ahead of us and I think mm. we should, you know, really get around that. Mm -hmm. Can I just quickly say on that, um, just to link the two, I know that like, you know, teenagers are spending so much time on their phone, but also monkey see, monkey do. If you're coming home and you're on your emails, you're coming home and you're working, you're coming home and you're constantly <laughs> distracted by work, um, they're learning off you, yeah. just saying. <laughs> Mm. I think the best, the best advice I got was is the human brain doesn't actually multitask, it, it, does, it can't do it. So all you're really doing is, is doing a lot of things probably not that well. So, you know, and people text and drive, and I know they do it, um, I don't personally, but, but you know, you've got to say to yourself, you, you are disconnecting from doing a very dangerous task for a period of time. Uh, and I think in the workplace too, it, it, it's become prolific. I, you know, in the building most days, I try to, um, you know, people work in their social media, uh, you know, in, the, in their jobs. Um, and I can remember when I was on next week with ASB with Barbara Chapman, I think Roger Beaumont and Lindy Woody here with me. You know, Barbara was so strict on it. If you send emails in the executive meeting, if you had your phone on and you send a text, she would be so angry. Mm -hmm. uh, she would. Um, and that was a good message for all leaders. You know, it's focusing on the task at hand and doing it well. Because I think when you start to do that as a human being, you then start to get into anxiety. You're waiting for a text to come through. You're trying to concentrate on something else. And the brain just doesn't do it well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I think we should talk a little bit about financial well-being because that, that is a, one of the key pillars, certainly in the Treasury framework. Um, Craig, w what is your impression as to the average New Zealander's um, financial literacy? Do, do you get a sense that it is improving at the moment and that people are becoming more literate? I think there's been absolutely huge focus um, over a number of years around financial literacy and I think, you know, Government putting more funding into the Commission for Financial Capability is a really good thing. Um, but you know, lots of people are doing lots of things in lots of spaces, so sometimes that can cause confusion for um, a lot of kids with it's in, in, in schools or whatever. And um, you know, the Capital Markets you know, 2029 report you know, it has got some really good stuff in there around let's start in schools. I know there's a curriculum there. Um, but I think it's about having a consistent message. And you know, from a, you know, a national perspective, I think our financial literacy is lower than a lot of other countries. Um, you look at Australia, for example, even having had compulsory super there for, you know, what, 27 odd years now, the, you know, the level of financial literacy in Australia is a lot higher than what is in New Zealand. And so I think you know, KiwiSaver in New Zealand and uh, what the Minister talked about this morning, you know, the focus on that, that of itself is going to increase financial literacy and that's really, really important. Um, We've just got a lot further to go, and I think we have to, to start um, with kids. And you know, one of the key things is, as parents, you know, how do you educate your children on you know, finances and financial literacy? And it's very easy to pull out a credit card or an FPOS card and just pay for things. A ch from a child's mind, where well, everything's free, you just pull out this magic piece of plastic and you know, goods just turn up. And so you can have you know, tools like, you know, for, for my children, um, we go into a shop and they want to buy something, I give them cash. I say, okay, what are you buying? How much is it costing? How much change will you get? And then talk to them about where does that money come from? And so I think everyone in the room, whether it's, you know, you've got you know, children, nephews, nieces, um, it's really important to, you know, to start really, really young with people and um, you know, that'll start an intergenerational um, education. 
then look at my parents, um, you know, asset rich, cash poor, and you know, I was astounded uh, when my father said to me one day, he says, oh, I've never really understood the difference between fixed and floating mortgage, can you help me? And he's in his 60s, and he'd been a great businessman. And you know, he said, oh, the finance side of it just doesn't work for me, so I think we've all got a role to play, in this, you know, and when we look even sort of um, at, at well-being, and you know, everyone is in a different place um, in, in their lives, everyone's come from a different background, a different experience, Yes, we have to have common tools and common training to, to help people, but it's about those who are in the know helping those who, who aren't in the know. I just find it startling. You know, I, I have friends who, who recently I've spoken with, and I've said, oh, who's your KiwiSaver with? And they said, oh, oh uh, I don't know. Or, or oh, you know, I, th I, think it, I think it might be with ANZ. And you're like, well, how can you not know this? I said, well, okay, what, what fund have you got it in? Yeah, what? And they'll say... Ooh, no, nah, I haven't logged in ever. I find these are these are adults. These are people in their late thirties, and I think, for goodness' sake, what are you doing? <laughs> but but that's a fairly typical experience still. You know, with all of the successes of, of Kiwi, KiwiSaver and and the enormous growth of those funds, we still have a lot of New Zealanders who just show no interest whatsoever. Are you laughing because you're in this position, Jazz? You should have done. No, no. Okay, no, this is great. Why why, why don't you? Why aren't you interested in KiwiSaver? <laughs> no, it's not that I'm not interested. Um, it's that I, I didn't really know what to do. Or I like literally, I wasn't taught this in school. I didn't know. And I think like four months ago, someone was like, "Where's your?" Literally asked that question. "Where's your KiwiSaver?" And I was like, "Well, I used to bank over here, and then I moved here, and then I don't know where it went. It kind of disappeared in between." <laughs> um, and so literally like two weeks ago, I reapplied, but I didn't really know what I was supposed to do, so I kind of just went along. Don't have to tell us who it's with. Do you know what fund you've got it in? Next okay. question. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, this is, this is, this is, this is really insightful. No, this is, this is valuable because, I mean, there, is, there are a number of people in this room, for example, who would say that when, when you at your age are opening a KiwiSaver fund, you should automatically be enrolled in a growth fund. What do you think about that, Angie? So I'll say a few things. So um, I've, I've been really surprised at the low level of financial literacy. Uh, BNZ last year, we closed the bank for a day and all our BNZers went out into the community and especially in high schools with a budgeting app and we did financial literacy uh, classes. I was shocked and these are school leavers and the app's got all sorts of things in there about um, uh, you're working time and a half versus hourly rate, around credit card debt, around um, just, uh, just helping you make good decisions and showing you when it's not a good decision. And the only kids in the classes, and we were out and about all day, um, that had any sense of it were those that actually their parents had sat with them, which is exactly how I learnt. My dad, small business, used to sit and talk about it at the kitchen table. Um, when I worked, we had the till, the cash registers, we had to do it all manually and you had to tally up at the end of the day and learn all the prices. So I do think a lot of it has to be in the schools and a lot of the principals we spoke to, they very keen to start financial literacy at younger ages. It's not when you leave mm. school, it should be at a younger age. The other thing that we see as well, uh, we have a, um, a signature customer experience called Financial Health Check. So we've done over 100,000 of those this year. And what we have found, and this is where we sit with our customers and talk about their goals, their challenges, their objectives, and then build a plan around that. And most of it is around a budgeting plan. And the two uh, key goals that come out of those, so we did 150,000 last year, we've done 100,000 already this year. The number one goal is managing my debt, help me save for my first home. And the second one is actually give me education around KiwiSaver. How does it work? What does it mean? How should I be thinking about it? So there, that, that's a common theme. So I think we have to um, educate early and we have to get everyone interested in, in their KiwiSaver because mm. those stats, 60%, of New Zealanders do not think they're going to have a comfortable retirement. And that's not good for wellness. I think we can all agree upon that. It's funny, I think when, you know, when I was a kid, I had a paper round, and um, being the son of an accountant and a mathematician, every time the pay slip came through, I had to sit down with a notebook, save 65% and 35% I was allowed for spending. And I had to make sure that bloody book balanced every week as a 12 year old. <laughs> So you can imagine I'm a lot of fun to date these days. It's a <laughs> but but it's a, I mean clearly there is there is there is a, a degree of responsibility that comes from parenting. That that education issue is such a key one, isn't it? And I think you know I don't know if you've ever considered the New Zealand curriculum at the moment, but it's about two A4 sheets thick. 
it's so broad as to barely define anything specifically in the New Zealand education. Nick, Nick what's your perspective there? Do you think um, the government should be mandating some form of financial literacy education? Oh, look, I, again, you know, having two daughters that are in the, the final years of their schooling education, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty... It's pretty light. I mean, I, I am the advisor when it comes to financial matters in the, in the house, and my wife, actually, who's more capable than I am. Um, but when I think about do the kids understand what KiwiSaver is, only because they went into the scheme when they went into part-time jobs, and that was a big debate. They said, oh, what's going on? Why is all my pay going into my, into my account? What's this KiwiSaver thing? 65, so far away. You know, I'm, I'm 16 years old. Mm. Those things are, you know, they're moments of truth. But um, we're having this discussion at the moment um, with my daughter in her sixth and seventh form years. Um, you know, what, what career should she go into? What does the finance you know, industry offer her and, and financial advice and all these things? And I just don't think people get um, a really broad understanding of, of the paths that they can go down, the things they can do. Uh, and, and that starts with having good knowledge. Right. of those sectors, uh, and, and if you don't understand things yourself, how can you make decisions about the path you go down in the future? And that's a, a really big gap. I think, you know, look, when it comes to maths, English, and all the traditional stuff, but it hasn't really changed since I was mm. at school. It really hasn't. But has the world changed? No, <laughs> of course it has. Yeah. Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, we really appreciate those questions that have been submitted through the app so far. I'll go to a couple of those now and then we'll continue our conversation. Christine, a good question there on the four-day working week. In your experience, if it doesn't affect productivity in any great way, does that mean people are pouring five days worth of stress into four days? Yeah. Um, yeah, so a question actually we get asked a lot. Uh, and I guess the thing is that, um, you know, this is now... Uh, just close to a year or coming up to a year of, of um, the experiment, I guess, in that way. Um, so essentially it is uh, the connection between employee engagement, uh, feeling empowered to make good decisions, um, have more time, uh, be able to connect, whatever, you know, all those things I was talking about before, um, and then productivity. So um, on that basis, it's about working differently, thinking, thinking differently, and making choices in regards to how we're working to be able to focus on the outcome. So what are the outputs? What are the things that I'm doing in my job? And what's the value of that to customers, um, internal customers and external? So from that perspective, um, so with, uh, with the research that we did um, as part of that first trial, then stress went down. I think it is actually, it can be in some of the qualitative research that it was the, the focus groups. Some people did say actually it was kind of stressful. Some of them said um, it was stressful on my day off trying to then think what I was going to do, which I found really quite amazing when I got that bit of, bit of feedback. Um, but some people did say it actually it made them really think differently about what is it that I'm actually doing. Um, but I actually think that's a good a good piece to come out of this is actually, you know, we're, we're conditioned to work in a particular way and sometimes we're doing work in a way that we might have done um, as an organisation, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. So how are we enhancing um, our minds? We've got new people coming into the business and so thinking about doing things differently, coming up with ideas and embracing those, giving them a go, giving them a whirl, um, but also the use of technology in a way and so just, you know, that job design sort of space I think is quite important. So, um, so is, does it put people under stress? I, I like to think that it actually sort of um, it, it means more about and an an uh, creates an energy and a focus to be able to look at work differently. So it's not about um, working harder, it's actually trying to work smarter. So right. actually thinking about um, the type of work that I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and what's the value, so the productivity outcome or output. Okay. A good question here for Angie and Craig. Craig, we can start with you. What is your organisation doing to improve financial education amongst New Zealand's poorest and most vulnerable? And you know, one of the key things we're doing is you know, supporting the Commission for Financial Capability. Now, I sort of mentioned before around you can go out and run your own programs, but what that can often do is confuse. And you know, the vulnerable part of New Zealand is, you know, is, is quite a challenge. Um, so you know, we support the Commission for Financial Capability. Another thing that I've done recently is um, you know, when, as a default provider, you've got an obligation to activate um, the customers. And so I go to the contact centre and I join those calls, and it's absolutely fascinating. You know, we make thousands of calls a year. Um, to default customers, and you know, just like sort of Jazz said, you know, some people don't even know they've got KiwiSaver when you call them, and some people don't want to talk about it or aren't available, but you know, for those who, you know, it piques their interest, over the course of 30 minutes they go from not even knowing they've got KiwiSaver to then you know, talking about their, what their expectations are, their careers, their lives, um, their retirement expectations, and going from saying, retirement so far away, not even thinking about it, to say, oh, actually, is that what happens? And then talking about funds, and, and I'm self-employed, how do I do that? So 
um, you know, that, that's a big part of our role as a default provider, but it's just sort of one way that yeah, you can go and actually have an input in and mm. educate. But you know, it's up to everybody you know, to do it, and it's very challenging just coming back to sort of the, you know, the school curriculum um, point. There is actually a curriculum for schools to teach it, but the challenge we have is our teachers are just so busy. Um, you know, I mentioned to Minister Farfoy, um, um, but a year ago, and he said, well, my wife's a teacher. He said, um, if I tell her that she's got to teach financial capability as well, he said, I'd probably be sleeping on the couch. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very real. We've got a shortage of teachers. Teachers are very stressed. It's an important time to do it. Um, but you know, it's just got to be consistent um, training for people um, you know, right from, from the ground up. Um, mm. And I don't think that having multiple players in the market doing lots of different things is going to help. Yes, you can go to um, you know, citizens' advice bureaus, you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, customers when they come to a branch or contact centre, and that's really, really important. Um, but I think it's only through time and absolute focus by everyone um, on it that we can do that. Mm. Angie? So we've been doing a few things. I think um, uh, it's so important. There's so many vulnerable communities. Uh, we have a community finance program where we um, go out into the community with the Good Shepherd and we provide low and no interest loans, but every one of those goes with a budgeting conversation. So we've, we've helped about 1,700 families. Um, it's just so amazing to speak to them and, and their little loans, $500, a couple of hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, it actually helps them do a course to get back to work, uh, fix the car uh, so they can go to work, take the kids to school. So it has a huge impact on their lives and the budget conversation has a huge impact on their lives. We found that just through that budgeting help, uh, and that financial capability that we give them, they're able to stay in work, they're able to save money. The other thing we've done, we've partnered with the Salvation Army and, and with other really good New Zealand uh, companies uh, with, the, with the good shop. So both of those initiatives, I'm on this mission to disrupt the payday lenders and the mobile uh, traders. And, and just again, going out and making sure that people can put food on the table at a fair price instead of what those mobile traders are charging for Milo at $45 and other things. And also we've been helping them around no interest loans and again, getting food on the table, getting them back to work. Um, so I think that they're just it's so important, the budgeting as well, with those conversations. Mm -hmm. And again, we're just helping those organisations put more counsellors out there, put more loan workers out there. We've trained people in our contact centres as well, uh, because a lot are excluded from financial products. So training them up so that, you know, when our policies um, don't allow the loan, typically they're, they're in financial hardship. They need, they need around community finance um, uh, opportunities, low and no interest loans. Uh, but again, the conversation around budgeting is, is so important. So every one of them has to be with, with that conversation. Mm. Can I just quickly say, um, I, so when I was um, 16, I completely separated out from my family, which is, I'm going to use that as my excuse as to why I didn't know how to use KiwiSaver. I didn't have parents that taught me. But um, when I was 18 and I, I got my first job, um, I managed to somehow get uh, very, very large loans out. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was very uh, up and down, and there was not a single budgeting conversation. There was not a single, so, you know, and I, I got myself into really bad debt as an 18-year-old um, and then completely spiralled. That was one of the pressures that I had as well. And, um, you know, was kind of in and out of these psych wards and had all of this. So to know now um, that that's something that is happening, my 18-year-old self thanks you so much because uh, yeah. I think that would have really, like, really benefited me as someone who was poor and vulnerable back then. Um, I think that could have saved me years of, of hardship, so thank you. I'm going to come to a couple more questions in a moment, but there's a key pillar to well-being. Oh, do you want to say something, Catherine? Yeah. No, you go first. Yeah, I just you wanted go. to add really quickly as well that it's worth reflecting on our own employees as well. So when we think of financial services, I mean, in my, having worked in financial services, my brain goes to lots of really clever, rich people that are actually, you know, they know what they're doing when it comes to money. But actually, when you think about your employees as a whole, so there's an organ, as an organisation, this is something that CDHB has done down in um, Canterbury. And they realized that actually when they took their employees as a whole, there was an awful lot of people that they employ that aren't in that category. So they had an awful lot of people that fell above the minimum wage but below the living wage. 
Um, and so what they did was they actually looked at their own employees and um, decided that they were going to make some changes around how they supported them. So they've brought in financial literacy training for the porters, for the cleaners, you know, for the orderlies, for the people that work within the DHB that aren't traditionally going to be um, able to, to have that kind of conversation, both with themselves and with their own kids. So with, you know, if the, the schools the schools haven't got the time and the resources to do that. Mm. So I think it's really important that we as an industry reflect on who do we employ and how can we make sure that they're also equipped to have these conversations on our behalf. Mm. I think that's a really good point. I have a, um, a friend who's a senior television producer and she, um, she said to me a few months back, she, she'd come into $15,000 or so through some inheritance and she said, oh, um, I'm going to put that straight into my student loan. I said, that sounds really good. What's your credit card debt out of interest? She said, oh, it's, it's quite big at the moment. It's like 11 grand or something. I said, right, okay, so just to be clear here, you, you're going to pour that money into your student loan because you're not happy with potentially having to pay interest if you move overseas on that debt. But at the same time, you're paying 22% on your credit card debt. It was astonishing to me because, she, I mean, she, she is, you know, an, an, an educated, successful woman who lack some basic understanding ar around numbers. And I think it's really easy just to assume a lot of the mm -hmm. time that, you know, that, that all you know, successful people are equipped with those sorts of skills. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, um, to talk about another key pillar of, of well-being that we haven't really touched on at all so far today, but is clearly um, critical as, as we look forward, and that's environmental well-being. I wonder if any of the panel have a perspective on the role of big organisations and this community in the future of New Zealand's environmental well-being and indeed global well-being. Look, I think from my point of view, I spend a lot of time travelling um, into Asia, uh, and so I think you know, perspective-wise, I think New Zealand does does have a good start in that process. Um, you know, we have a relatively low polluted environment that we live in. Um, but as, a, as an organisation, yes, we're looking at ways that we can be um, better. Um, how can we have a, a lower footprint? How can we, how can we help our people uh, e equally be um, you know, better citizens of the country? Uh, and they're, they're quite complex questions, but you know, my belief is anything I can do inside the building that I, that I look after, I will do. I can't control outside of the building that easy. I'd like to one day maybe, but um, but at, at the moment, you know, we look at ways of, of having you know lockers heating. We look at uh, more efficiency in the building in terms of just activ activity-based work flows, etc. Flexible work hours, so people don't have to come to work in rush hour traffic. You would not believe the footprint you leave by having to be in the car for an hour, an hour and a half every day going each way. So how can we get staff working around those those trends, the things that we've all explored? So as financial services, we've got a huge <coughs> role to play. Firstly, in, in we lend to a lot of industries and a lot of customers, so we're, we're doing a lot of work on helping our customers that are in industries that have to move to be more sustainable. So a lot of work with our agri customers, especially around natural value. How do we help them and make sure that their land is sustainable? What are the practices that we can help them? What are we seeing of ones that are doing best practice? How can we help them with ag tech? There's industries that are, that are needing to move into a more carbon sustainable footprint. So what can we do as financial service providers? Uh, as an employer, it's uh, flexible work. One in seven of our people are flexibly working. How can we make sure they stay connected when they're flexibly working? We're looking at everything, our cars. How do we put them all mm. to electric cars? Um, again, how does everyone on their iPad or on their mobile can uh, face in uh, to meetings so that they're not travelling, uh, getting up in the mornings early and, and travelling to meetings? How do we go to people's meetings and not coming and seeing executive teams, etc.? So I think there's a lot of those things and then how do we support with the capital markets and, and um, you know, help with the green bonds, which we've been uh, pioneering here in New Zealand, but I think there's a lot more we can be doing around those things. Yeah. Well, what about it, and this is big picture stuff I know, and, and tricky for you, and Craig and Angie in particular, well, what about you know, when you are looking at businesses in the future and you are considering investments, whether this is through KiwiSaver or anything else, there's a big asterisk that comes alongside any value proposition whereby you say, yes, the numbers shape up here, this is going to be a profitable business, but actually we're not prepared to lend you the money you want because we're concerned about the environmental impact of your business. Yeah. 
and, and that's right. No, yeah. you go, keep going. Sorry. Um, so, so something that um, that I'm really excited to be part of is something called the B Corporation. I don't know if anybody is um, involved in the B Corporation here, but if you're saying, you know, how do we make environment and well-being serious in organisations? Well, we put it on the scorecards. We put it on the um, on the way that we measure success mm -hmm. within the organisation. I don't know if anybody's here from either Sharesies or Banker, um, but those are two organisations that have um, uh, accredited with the B Corporation, um, which basically means um, that as an organisation, you're not just committed to profit and shareholder profit, you're actually committing to um, to the wider environmental and people aspects of your business too, um, and you're measured on it, and that's and that's tracked. Mm -hmm. And what they're seeing is that investors are much more likely to come your way, um, uh, employees um, are much more likely to come your way too, because you're showing a very very visible commitment um, to this uh, mm -hmm. to this very important part of. Oh, it's of business. interesting though, I know, you know, like we've seen in the just the last couple of weeks, the Business Roundtable in the States saying they no longer see that they solely have a fiduciary duty to shareholders and that actually um, they need to consider business in a, in a wider context. So I'd, I'd go back to that question, Craig and Angie. I mean, do, do you see a corporate responsibility there? Absolutely there is, and I think, you know, you know part of the expectations of all of the investors, you know, whether it's from KiwiSaver or other funds, is that, you know, we will take, you know, the environmental measures very seriously and the whole concept of you know, environmental, social and governance is at the forefront of you know, everything we look at from an investment perspective. Um, you know, we have a signatory for United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing. Um, and you know, that has very clear requirements as, as what you do and don't invest in. And you know, there's absolutely proof out there now that you, you can take an environmental approach and you know, an ESG approach to investment and still get a very good return. And, in fact, you know, a lot of um, investors out there are willing to get slightly lower return um, to make sure that they are in an, an environmentally um, you know, friendly or environmentally appropriate fund, and you know, they expect us to, to be thinking about that every day. And so it's really, really important, and you know, I think that you know, from the grassroots of our kids in schools, and you know, it's just you know, the issue that everyone's thinking about, and we have to take that responsible approach. Angie? So I, I can absolutely a plus one on that. Um, uh, we've got uh, funds that are ethical funds and, and we actually see that our, our clients absolutely want us to be thinking like that. Um, our ESG commitments um, extend to industries and we're doing a lot of work on, on, on that as well. Um, and we've got requirements from the Australian parent as well around a lot of those things, the diversity, the ESG, our, our footprint, our carbon footprint. Um, we're signed up to a number of the international UN standards as well. Um, but I think we've all got much more opportunity around that. I think our people too, when they, um, when they look at organisations they want to join, they want to join organisations that have a, a higher purpose and, and it's about more meaning and that helps with wellbeing as well. So I think that that also encourages me that if we're doing the right things around, around uh, what's important for New Zealand, that we will attract um, the talent as well. Mm. We've only got a couple of minutes left before we all break to Kai. So uh, I will ask a couple of questions for the, for the whole panel to consider. If you have any strong thoughts, please speak up. Can a business focus too much on well-being at the expense of financial prosperity or is well-being in the long-term interests of financial prosperity? Happy to, happy to start. Look, I think for me, uh, we are a wellness company and, and I think the, the health of your people and the performance of your people are a function of, the, of their well-being. There's no question about that. Teams perform well uh, when they're mentally well, when they're physically well and when they're engaged. And I think the whole thing comes together. I, I don't believe um, they, they, don't, um, they don't partner. Um, is there a point where um, you can go too far? I think that's the same with anything in life. You know, you just need to be sensible and pragmatic about it. Um, you have a shareholder obligation, but equally, you know, the shareholder that I work for is a well-being advocate. So, you know, it's a very popular and easy message to to work with. I I think it actually comes back to the, you know, what is well-being, and we were discussing that a wee bit before. Well-being isn't just about, you know, your mental well-being and, and how you're feeling and, um, you know, the connections with your families and all those sorts of things. It's actually, you know, it's the community, it's the markets, it's, pro it's productivity, it's about financial well-being as well. And so when you look at it from a holistic perspective as opposed to quite narrow lens, then um, how can it not be a centre of what your um, your planning is and, and how you, you're, you're trying to be? So I think it's, you, you 
you know, when it's foremost, it's um, front and centre, then it's, it's, it's needing to touch all of those. I think it's really simple. If you focus on the well-being of your staff and give them the mandate to focus on the well-being of your customers, then that is your business that will deliver shareholder re returns. And so, you know, you start close and, and you build out, but, you know, focusing on the well-being of your customers is just as important as your staff. Very, very quickly, um, I obviously am not in the realm of what you guys do, but I, I speak at corporate industries all the time and a lot of financial industries I've spoken at as well. And quite literally, probably every single time I've spoken in a corporate environment, um, there has been at least one person come up to me saying that they were feeling suicidal that day. Um, and these are these are people that are in your companies. Um, and so, you know, having the, uh, if one person takes their life, that's a ripple effect throughout your entire business. So having the the focus and, and putting well-being at the forefront um, will long term um, will help a lot because you, you never know what's going on in your within your staff. But every single corporate that I spe uh, every single corporate business that I speak at, um, it, it, it happens all the time. Mm. Yeah. Okay, panel. I think that's a good place to end. I know everyone here will be agitating for a something to eat, a cup of tea, and to stretch the legs. So, will you please join me in thanking our panel this morning? Jazz Thornton, Nick Stanhope, Craig Mulholland, Christine Brotherton, Catherine Jackson, and Angie Mentis. Kelda Kota.